Yeah. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for the uh, privilege of speaking to you. I'm not sure that I can be quite as passionate this morning as the last speaker, but I'll, I'll do my best to be myself at least. Um, I was asked to, to, to speak to you about the Irish Longitudinal Study on Ageing. I've, I've got what I'm sure you've been seeing in your practice for the last two months in my throat, so I'll speak as loudly as I can. I, are you all right at the back? Can you hear me? Great. Um, so we, 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 we started the Irish Longitudinal Study on Ageing. Um, we, we started piloting work for it back in 2006. And the study went into the field with the first wave in 2010. So we did four years of piloting and evaluation and very hard work um, uh, uh, allocating and identifying and securing sufficient funds to do the study because it's a, it's a big take, a study like this. So half of the money to pay for the study came from uh, philanthropy and from corporates uh, who, who made philanthropic gifts. Um, our Atlantic Philanthropies in particular, which is Chuck Feeney's organization, um, supported it significantly and gave almost 50% of the funding for the study and the remainder came from the Department of Health. And the reason we started this study was I came back from the UK <clears throat> in 2006 and rather naively I um, started to look around for large data sets that uh, would have sufficient information to uh, derive evidence-based uh, policy in, uh, uh, data in Ireland. You know, some sense of prevalence of disorders and you know, a multidisciplinary sort of picture around disorders with the socioeconomic picture, the social picture, etc. Um, in the in the aging context, and nearly all Western cultures are, now have longitudinal studies of aging, but there hadn't been one in Ireland. And actually, it transpired that the data at the time that was being used to drive policy in Ireland was being derived from Scottish and other European data sets, but we didn't have our own evidence-based data sets. So that's how the study started. That's how the vision for the study was, was born, and it's been a very successful study since then. And this gives you some sense of some of the sponsors for the study, and now a quarter of the study is sponsored by non-exchequer funding. We've got funds from the National Institute of Health in the USA and the European Union. So all of that is, is very important in the context of it being predominantly a study to drive policy in Ireland. I thought I'd <clears throat> kind of focus on those components of the study, the evidence we've got that is possibly pertinent to this audience vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, what might shape policy going forward and indeed might map quite nicely with the last number of speakers' um, aspirations. And just very, very briefly, the sort of the sort of background to the study um, and, and, and the reason it was, was generated was to respond to the challenge of population aging. I'm not going to go into the demographics. You're all very familiar with that. But there will be a major issue if we don't address this, um, this inevitable demographic change, which is already happening. Ireland needs quality data on older adults to inform policy and research in aging. It's a very large-scale study, nationally representative, and I'll come on to that in a moment, but that's important because that means for the first time we can actually um, uh, reliably um, engage with the data knowing it's representative, um, knowing that we can extrapolate on a national basis from the statistics. And it's very extensive, not just health, but social and economic data as well, because of course health doesn't occur, health isn't an island, and, and nobody knows this more, more than this particular audience, how important social and economic circumstances are to drive health, and vice versa. It's actually, because we were kind of late to the table with, with the longitudinal study in Ireland, it, it, it's, it's probably one of the, the key uh, of these studies now internationally. We were able to learn from the mistakes of other longitudinal studies, but also build in very innovative technologies and concepts into this study that others hadn't the opportunity to. And it's one of the few, it was, was one of the only ones then, um, that was led by, by clinicians or healthcare professionals, which meant that that particular domain of the data is very, very strong. So the whole idea behind it is to create a database um, to enable us to understand the experience of aging in Ireland. Um, that, that includes work and retirement, 
income and assets, mental health, very big sections on mental health, cognitive health, physical health, genetics, nutrition, family networks, social participation, education, household structures, marital status. So really comprehensive. And the way we deliver the study is, um, I'll go back to how we actually got the, day, the sample size. We estimated we needed 8,500 people to be a representative sample over the age of 50. We work closely with the SRI. We went to a, an address, a geo directory in the, in the SRI, which is a directory of addresses that's updated each year. But in other countries which have used this approach for longitudinal studies, they also have information, mostly from the general practitioner registries, of age to match addresses. So they know the addresses in which 50-year-olds or older are living, and they can, you know, cherry-pick those particular addresses in the first instance to call to. We didn't have that luxury in Ireland, so we had to actually cold call um, using randomly selected uh, 640 clusters of addresses, which is uh, equated to over 25,000 ho households, cold call on 25,600 houses across Ireland, and that shows you the distribution. Ask if anybody aged 50 or over lived there, and would they like to take part in a study in the first instance for the next 10 years? So it was a big ask. Remarkably, the response rate was 63%. That is, even given that design, exceptional on international terms. It was 2010, we were in our austerity period, and I think this particular age group were, were, were just really engaged, and have been since, uh, and it meant something to them to be giving something back in, 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 in this format to society in Ireland. The only other country <clears throat> that has a higher response rate is China. So we've, we've, we've been, we're on their advisory panel and they went into the field two years ago. Their response rate was 99%. But I'm reliably informed that that 1% are now dead. <laughs> so very good for, for Ireland. Um, 8,500 people aged 50 and above, and we picked 50, although it's a l allegedly an aging study, because of course aging starts in the womb. Uh, um, it would have been great to have done 40 and above, because again, this audience knows that these processes begin earlier, and they particularly begin earlier if your lifestyle behaviors are challenging or if your circumstances, economic or social, are challenging, or if there's significant family histories, but that would have meant a much larger sample size and a much more um, costly study. So 50 was our cutoff, and 50 is the cutoff in most studies internationally. We reassess the participants every two years and ask questions about health, wealth, and happiness. So what happens is an interviewer calls to the home, spends about an hour and a half using a computer-generated question system in the home and covers all sorts of self-report. And with respect to um, uh, disorders or health status, we ask about you know, your, own, your perceptions of health, self-rated health generally, globally, but we also ask about specifics. Has a doctor ever told you you have high blood pressure? Has a doctor ever told you you've had angina? Has a doctor ever told you you have atrial fibrillation or any other irregularity of the heart? Has a doctor ever told you you have diabetes, etc.? And we also check all of the medications the participants are on. So an hour and a half in the home, face-to-face -face interview. Um, Well-trained interviewers. As the study evolved, it became that there were a number of research infrastructural components to deliver something like this, which it just never, Ireland didn't have at the time, and, and, and these sorts of studies hadn't taken place in Ireland. So, a CAPI, a computer-assessed um, personal interview, using a face-to-face -face computer with an interviewer, that had never happened before in Ireland. So we introduced that system and trained up interviewers, and we, we actually tender for the survey, surveyors, to do this, and we, this year we're training 70 to 100 surveyors nationally to go into older, well, people 50, age, age 50 and plus homes and deliver these sorts of interviews. So in those two capacities, we, and those two components, we have um, introduced new research infrastructure, which is very valuable um, for Ireland as a community um, and as a, as a, as a business, uh, as, as a national business. So there are 100 people really well trained who can deliver these sorts of interviewers for market research, etc., going forward. And we use these people every two years. Also in the home, 
um, we leave a self-completion questionnaire for the more discreet questions. For example, um, adverse childhood events. And we know um, now very much in Ireland that childhood experiences hugely influence adult health. 6% of this cohort, and we estimate that's an underestimate, um, have experienced childhood sexual abuse. Mean age, 10. Average uh, length of abuse, six years, for example. And if you look at their health outcomes now, they do significantly worse. In fact, any childhood adverse events significantly influences adult health. So um, alcohol excess in the household with either parent, physical abuse, any forms of neglect, these um, adults now get depression, much four times more likely to be depressed in adult life. Um, four years earlier, they will um, um, experience cardiovascular disease, myocardial infarction and stroke, for example. So, so we, 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 we actually take some time in the interview to explore childhood events and diseases in childhood and the impact on adult health. It's really important. And, and, and we leave that self-completion questionnaire, and again, very high response rates with that. For that, we ask other sensitive questions like their relationships that, that, you, that a face-to-face -face interview couldn't glean um, satisfactorily, sexual relationships, sexual orientation, um, the quality of relationship with the spouse they're living with, um, with, the quality of relationship with their children, who they're going to leave their money to, etc. Um, and, and just to say, as you can imagine, with a data set like that, uh, we're, there are exquisite anon and anonymization um, strategies in place to, to guarantee anonymity. But in the interest of a public data set, it, it, most of the studies takes place in Trinity, although all of the institutions in Ireland are involved, all of the institutions. The data is publicly archived in a data set in, tr in UCD and in Michigan. So that we get the biggest bang for our buck from the study. It means lots of researchers internationally are analyzing our data, not just national researchers. So that um, given that some public money has gone into this, it's important that that investment sees output. And this was a way that, that and, and again, it was a first for Ireland. Uh, the tradition is for researchers to covet any, any re, uh, information that's gleaned like this for personal publication. So let's just focus on a few aspects of the study that I thought might be interesting for us to share this morning. The first, uh, and I'm calling them the untreated treatables. Again, just to backtrack a little, we described the face-to-face -face interview in the home with the computer and the interviewer. We described the self-completion questionnaire, but then participants are asked to come to either Trinity or Cork, whichever is their most nearest and also con most convenient. And they undergo a fairly extensive health assessment. It's not really a, it's not at all a diagnostic health assessment per se, but it's an understanding of physiology of aging. So we examine the eye very carefully, retinal artery architecture, macular degeneration, diabetic eye, hypertensive eye. Um, we examine cognition, planning, attention, lots of different memory tests, mood, mental health uh, components such as anxiety, depression, worry, loneliness. Um, we, we measure gait, gait speed, lots of different components of gait, very heavy um, emphasis on neurocardiovascular stability, which is blood pressure, heart rate, autonomic function, etc. Obviously, BMI, visual acuity, uh, bone density for osteoporosis, etc. So, a comprehensive health assessment. It's interesting to see every couple of health assessments how the same individuals, because that's what's important about understanding the process of aging, that you're actually applying the same assessments to the same individuals across time. How those same individuals age what their experiences have been, what the new incidence of disease and disorders is, and what the early risk factors were for those disorders. And that's really probably the primary objective of the study, understanding early markers that we can do something about to ultimately prevent whatever health outcome uh, one is interested in. So let's just concentrate, maybe first of all, on atrial fibrillation. 
Now, when I'm giving <clears throat> this uh, talk to, uh, with respect to atrial fibrillation to people who don't know what atrial fibrillation is, I do all sorts of things like this with my fingers, explaining how the atria do this, and it shoots off clots, but thankfully I don't need to do any of the actions um, this morning. So let's focus on atrial fibrillation. Very common um, irregularity of the heart um, aging. I'm also going to um, touch on hypertension, diabetes, <coughs> high cholesterol, and falls. Because these are big issues I think that uh, all of us encounter on a daily basis, um, and some of them can be you know, triggers for institutional care. Certainly vexing our emergency departments, our admission um, rates, when not handled properly, but um, very complex issues also to deal with in the setting of um, primary uh, care. And of course, falls are the commonest reason cited for admission to nursing home care. <clears throat> so, atrial fibrillation and irregularity of the heart can be persistent, obviously, or intermittent. Um, and it is the biggest modifiable risk factor for stroke in Ireland. <clears throat> for heart failure, a common risk factor. But something that people aren't particularly aware of maybe is that it's a major modifiable risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And of course, true Alzheimer's disease, we, we know now from neuropathological studies, um, pure Alzheimer's disease is less and less common. And Patients with Alzheimer's disease more and more um, are, are being recognized as having an underlying vascular platform for the Alzheimer's process. And vascular risk factors are major modifiable risk factors. In fact, our colleagues in the <clears throat> University of California have shown that if you manage blood pressure, physical exercise, and atrial fibrillation properly in midlife, you can reduce dementia Alzheimer's dementia, allegedly, by 30% in later life. So these are major modifiable risk factors for brain health as well as um, heart health. And we ask in the home, has a doctor ever told you you have atrial fibrillation or an irregularity of the heart or arrhythmia? <clears throat> and the results of this, and then of course we measure heart rhythm. So we've got the self-report of whether or not someone has atrial fibrillation, what they know, what they've been told, and we have the measurement, and we know what medications people are on. One third were aware that they had atrial fibrillation, and according to the CHADS VASC score and the HAS BLED score, both of which we can apply because of the information we collect, they were on the correct treatment. So one third, correct diagnosis, correct treatment. One third, didn't know that they had the arrhythmia that we'd established they had in the, in the uh, health assessment. And one third did know that they had it, but weren't on the correct treatment for the ar arrhythmia based on Chad's VASC uh, scores, etc. And just to, to show you, overall, over the over 50s, the prevalence is 2.3% of atrial fibrillation. But in men over 80, it was one in five. So one in five men over 80 in the study had atrial fibrillation. So it gets much, much more common, particularly in men, as people get older. So food for thought here. I'm going to park atrial fibrillation for the moment, but food for thought in the context of awareness and in the context of appropriate treatment and application of the CHADVAS scores nationally. And as a result of this, um, we've worked with the um, HSE um, and the Irish Heart Foundation to launch a campaign of awareness around atrial fibrillation, so self-awareness, so that individuals are aware if they have symptoms, what those symptoms might indicate, and whom, whom they should see, i.e. their general practitioner, if they feel such symptoms for, a, for an assessment. Um, and we've also um, embarked on a nationwide, apart from the self-awareness campaign with the Heart Foundation, a policy campaign with general practitioners to routinely screen where possible for atrial fibrillation. Um, this was piloted in the west of Ireland, predominantly in Galway. It was very successful um, and actually had very high detection rates in, in general practice, palpation of the pulse, and if the general practitioner is on 
dissatisfied that the patient or, or, or thinks the patient may have an irregular rhythm, then subsequent um, electrocardiogram. Um, I'm coming from a background of a strong family history of <clears throat> general practitioners and even extant general practitioners. I have a sister who's, who's a general practitioner who rings me three times a week to share her issues with hospitals. So I'm <laughs> really, really aware that of the need to properly resource any of our aspirations um, in Ireland to be uh, more inclusive. It's, of course, the way forward. But unless pra general practice is properly funded to undertake all of these extra tasks that we're imposing on them even currently, but planning to impose, it will not happen. And it won't happen appropriately because it's physically impossible. <clears throat> no, just in my experience, it's physically impossible for general practitioners to take any more on anymore without proper resourcing of restructuring as is necessary. So that's atrial fibrillation, hypertension. Um, and again, with respect to hypertension, 64% um, of over 50s were hypertensive. That's not a surprise. Um, of those with hypertension, however, almost half, 45%, um, weren't aware that they had high blood pressure. Now, you, you'll see in a moment that some of those were on treatment, and very often that's about um, patients just not listening when they're getting their um, prescriptions or, 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 or being given a diagnosis, etc. And maybe it's uh, maybe we need to um, provide some support on communication channels with patients with with, with respect to this. So 45% who had hypertension didn't know they had hypertension. Um, but but more than those who didn't know were on treatment. Not, nonetheless, almost a third who were hypertensive, and we use three different ways of measuring hypertension when it comes to the measurement, didn't know that they were hypertensive. So it's still a significant uh, number of people who had high blood pressure but weren't on antihypertensive treatments. Now, you, I'll come on to this a little bit later on. This is not an easy area. It's very easy for middle-aged people. It's very easy for the young old, people in their 60s and even in their 70s. I actually think treatment of hypertension in frailer over 80-year-olds, for example, and I don't believe in chron chronological age, but just for the sake of today's argument. In frailer older patients, it is very difficult <clears throat> to aggressively treat blood pressure because you run into more problems than solutions. And, and frankly, the, the data is not there in this particular cohort. I run a falls and, and syncopate clinic, and most of my time, 40% of what I do is I stop or reduce drugs. What we do is stop or reduce drugs. So, um, so this area of hypertension and treatment is contentious for the older old, but it isn't up until then. For the frail older, I think the jury is out. We need an awful lot more evidence, but for the vast majority, of course, hypertension, uh, appropriate treatment is important. And in the context of the new SPRINT study, the targets would probably be 130 over, 120 over 80. So much lower targets yet again. Of those who were on treatment, only half of those were controlled according to our metrics. So probably a lot of scope there for reevaluating management of hypertension, raising awareness amongst patients, because a lot of these people had never been to their general practitioner, so there wasn't even an opportunity to do opportunistic assessment or screening. And this was the case for 50 to 60-year-old men, particularly. I'm not sick. Men. Um, so, so just, just, just sharing that uh, uh, information with you, I think we need to raise awareness um, with, with respect to, to hypertension in, in the general pu public. Diabetes, a big, probably Western scourge now, scourge now but, but also in Ireland. Um, so how much diabetes out there is undiagnosed in Ireland? Um, Overall, it was about 10%. So one in 10 people, we used a hemoglobin A1C blood test, we take bloods on everybody, um, to <clears throat> estimate prevalence of diabetes. But in one in 10 who were diabetic, according to you know, very well accepted criteria, 
they were not aware, but that rose with age, up to a quarter of people 80 and over um, who had high, who had diabetes, were not aware that they had it. So again, raising awareness in this particular age group and just amongst practitioners who deal with this age group, and I include all practitioners in that, to, to, to be aware of diabetes and in people who have risk factors to, to know that. Finally, high cholesterol. <clears throat> So, uh, I've only put Lipitor in there because in Ireland it's by far the com most commonly prescribed um, cholesterol-lowering agent. And we looked at two groups of patients who we know are at high risk of cardiovascular events and in whom you know, rigorous management of cholesterol and blood pressure and rhythm is, is very important. Those with known cardiovascular disease and those with diabetes. And really, the guidelines here are very clear, and there isn't really any, um, any argument ab about, these, about these metrics. And, and, and the agreement is, the, the consensus is, that these patients should not have um, abnormal LDL or cholesterols um, above this level. But 38% of those with known cardiovascular disease did, and nearly half of those with diabetes did have abnormal LDL cholesterol metrics. Now again, these, are, these, 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 these particular guidelines are, are very, very clear. So we, we need to, we, all of us in our practice, need to probably be more rigorous about cholesterol control in these two particular cohorts over 50. And finally, probably dearest to my heart. I, I did train as a cardiologist initially before I went into age-related cardiology, and my interest is in falls and blackouts and, um, and how cardiovascular diseases affect our heads. Falls are a big issue. Falls are a big issue <clears throat> for general practice. Again, one of the phone calls during this week from my sister was about a, an elderly lady who had fallen, multiple fractures, and she had nowhere to send her. She absolutely had nowhere to send her for a proper assessment. She had been in ED recently. She had been admitted to hospital. She had had her fractures treated, but nobody addressed why was this frail, older woman falling. So, of course, she fell again. Let's just look at a population level of how common these symptoms are. Blackouts occur in about 5% of people over the age of 50 per year. So 5% of a sinkable episode per year. Falls become much more common with aging. 17% of those, 17 of those 50 to 64, 20% 20, 20 of those 65 or 74, and a quarter of people 75 and over have had at least one fall in the previous year. And we ask in the study about the characteristics of the fall. <clears throat> we ask, did you definitely slip or trip? That's those falls. But we also ask, did any of the falls occur kind of out of the blue? You're not clear that you slipped or tripped? Like a drop attack, did you just go down but not lose consciousness? Because, of course, lose consciousness is this. Remarkably, 8% of the 50 to 64 year olds had one of those what we call drop attacks for the sake of argument. 9% of the 65 to 74 year olds and 12% of the 75 plus. Now we know that that sort of a fall needs to be investigated because it probably has a cardiovascular background. It's a drop in blood pressure that caused it, or an ir irregularity, or something like that. But it isn't just a simple accidental fall. They need to be addressed. <clears throat> and I pulled out some emergency room data from the, um, the ED in St. James's. We work very closely with our emergency room colleagues, obviously. And thank you. And this just gives you an idea of how common this symptom is in the emergency room. And it, in, in other studies, we've seen that it's the commonest single reason for people over 50, single reason for people over 50 to attend the emergency room. And these are the admission rates for fallers, all kinds of fallers and blackouts. So 10% of people over 50 who come with a fall are admitted. But that rises dramatically 
50% of the over 80s who come to the emergency room with a fall are admitted. So are there opportunities here for us? I'm going to just rush through this. Are there opportunities for us here to do something in ER with ambulatory care, we came back to that earlier, which would have an effect? And we know that when people stand, we, get, we all get a drop in our, in our uh, blood pressure transiently when we stand because we pool anything up to a liter in our legs. And the coffee you're about to have now will help with the pooling. <laughs> that affects peripheral flow. We, we've got fantastically sensitive nerves in our, in our brain, which correct for that within two seconds for most of you in the room. Those of you like me who are over 50, it's five. Um, um, however, as we get older, we don't have the capacity to write that. And, and we get a drop in our blood pressure when we stand. This is the way we me measure blood pressure in Tilda with every single beat. It's a new system we use, and we use it in our Falls Clinic. It's a fantastic system for measuring st uh, blood pressure behavior. And so there's a big drop when we stand. But as we get older, that drop, that's for 50-year-olds, so that it drops and it pulls right back, stabilizes within seconds. 60 to 69-year-olds, eh, it takes a bit longer to stabilize. 70-year-olds, longer again to stabilize, takes a minute to get normal brain blood flow after standing. And almost half of the over 80-year-olds don't actually stabilize blood pressure to the sitting blood pressure or lying blood pressure levels. That's massive. This is the group that don't do well if you aggressively treat their high blood pressure when they're sitting or lying. Okay, and that's the group we know very little about, but that's the group that you, you, this audience is very familiar with in the context of dizziness and, and falls. And we know from the study now, because we followed these people up for five years, that this leads to falls, and particularly injurious falls. Drugs are a big cause of that. So what are we doing in Ireland about this? And I'm going to finish on this. So we started a diploma course for falls and blackouts in the Royal College of Physicians the year before last. We had the second one this year. It's the first in the world. There are 30 places. There were two general practitioners on this, but also ED doctors and other doctors. In St. James's, we run a falls and blackout unit for 14-year-olds to 90-plus-year-olds. We see four and a half thousand people a year, far, far too many. But when I ran this sort of facility, in the UK, we showed that running a proper falls and blackout ambulatory care service reduced the activity in the teaching hospital we were working in at the time by the equivalent of a 31-bedded medical ward in a year. So a massive saving in, in admissions. Not only that, but a far more accuracy around diagnosis and management and prevention of subsequent events. So our aspiration is to get one of these falls and sink bay units in each of the major hospitals in Ireland, at least eight units nationally initially. We're starting by training people on how to properly evaluate blood pressure, how to properly evaluate cardiovascular systems, how to properly evaluate the, the multidisciplinary causes of falls and blackouts in older, in everybody, in everybody, because we see a lot of young girls who, who, have, who have different problems with falling and blacking out. Get that training out there for nurses and for doctors. And get dedicated facilities in, in eight, at least eight centres in Ireland who can deal with this. I, the data is there to show that this will make a difference to our emergency units. And I estimate it will reduce my sister's phone calls by 30% <laughs> if we're successful. And I'll leave you with that message. Thank you. <clears throat>